interesting stories from working in sports diplomacy or with the United Nations? Um, sport diplomacy is something that I can talk about because it was very different than where I worked before. I always worked in a very serious institution where you have to be sued and you always have to think about what to say and you have to be strategic. Sporting world, on the other hand, I went there because I was supposed to do sport diplomacy, which is still a strategic thinking, but I had a chance to hang out with lots of athletes, especially Western world, not Korea. Uh, many athletes are involved in diplomacy. I mean, Korea is mostly um, politicians or politics or people who are involved in government. So what happens is when you hang out with sports people, athletes, they can look at you, they can scan you, and then tell what sports you did, you know, by looking at your, you know, sort of muscle, muscles and your shape. Um, so they could tell whether you're a wrestler, or whether you're a boxer, whether you're the um, tennis player. Whenever I appear in that setting, they will look at me and scan through me, and then not sure what to say, <laughs> because I never played any sport. So they will look at me like, what sports? did you do? Because they assume that you're an athlete, former athlete to be involved in sport diplomacy. So I, I would hesitate and say, I only exercise my brain. <laughs> Another interesting story will be when I worked for the European mm -hmm. Parliament. That's where I worked as an advisor for Korea Peninsula related issues. And we used to have high level North Korean officials coming to visit Europeans because there are many issues that North Koreans would come um, to get help from the European Union. And because I speak Korean, they never wanted me in the meeting room. So I had to stay outside. Although I was the advisor, North Korean officials would say that we don't want South Korean to be part of the negotiation. So I would always sit outside and wait for the meetings to finish. But on the same day in the evening, I would get a phone call from South Korean embassy wanting to meet me for dinner. So obviously they want information about what went on during the meeting. Is there anything they keep asking questions? And I would say, well, I don't know. I don't know. And they thought I was being such a good employee, being very confidential <laughs> about the things that, that were happening at the European Union, yeah. but it was not my intent. Yeah. I really didn't know what was going on in the meeting. What is your go-to outfit for when you're networking or during your diplomacy? Oh, right. Yes, it depends on the situation, but normally if you're invited to a network meeting or conferences or events, then the invitation card does have this dress code. So you have to comply to the dress code that's given. But in order to give you some tips, you know, I wear suits all the time, but then wearing the same suit over and over again, especially when you're traveling, you're bag has limited space, that what you do is like you pack just two suits with many different colorful scarves. Mm -hmm. And scarves can actually give you a different change along with your hairdo. Mm -hmm. So basically when you're mm -hmm. traveling on business and if you can't carry too many things, I would advise people to take many scarves and try to do different um, hairdos. Um, another interesting occasion that I can think of is uh, being invited to a royal wedding in Monaco. I was invited to do sport diplomacy because Prince Albert, he was getting married, so sports-related people were invited. So I had a chance to travel, but I got the invitation card and they said I have to wear three different dresses for three different occasions. For the event beforehand, you actually have to wear three different dress. So they had a dress code, specifically what to wear. It was expensive. It was an expensive <laughs> event because I had to get everything new. I got a nice hat and I had to find a dress that matches the hat. And that was a challenge. Yeah. The actual day when I bought my uh, long red dress, I was listening to the radio in the taxi. I just got the dress and got in the taxi. Then the news says the bride-to-be, she ran away. <laughs> and she got caught again at the train station. She ran away, you know, because I guess she was very nervous. Yeah. Prince Albert's um, bodyguards mm -hmm. actually 
called her wow. at the uh, train station. And I was actually swearing in the taxi and saying, I just bought my expensive dress. You can't cancel the wedding. So I still remember that day, you know, when I heard the news that I was getting really upset yeah. over my bill that I had to pay. Yeah. I still have that dress. I can't fit in anymore. I grew out of it. So what made you decide that George Mason was the right institution to teach at? Oh, good question. I, I was um, looking back and I can say that I did not choose George Mason University Korea, but I think George Mason University Korea chose me. I was a special lecturer. So I came here um, every week to teach athletes a sports diplomacy. So it's a very interesting story looking back because I was coming to this campus to teach for other programs and I learned that there were four American universities on this campus. And I knew Professor Wilson during that time, and I knew he was working here, so I came to see him. Then I had a chance to meet him with the Academic Affairs Dean, and she said, we need somebody to teach government-related courses. And during that time, I was teaching um, at Yonsei University for graduate students. So I said, I can only teach twice a week, so I wasn't thinking of full-time uh, faculty, but it was more of a lecturer type. So I said I could, I could teach some classes, but I never had the intent of you know, settling down here. But you know, life is full of surprises. As time goes by, I, I learned that this was a setting where I feel most comfortable. Um, I love the students. This institution grew, and I grew along with the institution professionally. And now I feel at home here. I feel like I'm the one of the pioneers to have been with like young students who are now working at different institutions. So that really makes me feel that I'm very old. You know, this is my seventh year at George Mason University, Korea. But sometimes you step into something and then you find it that this is a setting where you feel like you're most re uh, you feel rewarded. What is one word that describes your life as a professor or a diplomat or whichever role you feel you identify most with? Well, uh, in my career, before coming to George Mason University Korea campus, I had very busy life. You know, my career was 9 to 9 job. I had to run around everywhere. I had to constantly travel. So this is like sort of my first time to feel like reset. So I guess in that sense, my life as a professor really is a rewarding experience. Finally, who is or maybe was your inspiration? Um, right now, I have no inspiration from nobody. <laughs> That's really sad. If I can say this, I really get inspired by students, especially when I get letters or video messages from the student. It really makes me feel that I want to be a better person want to be a better role model. I think little comments that come from students really inspire me and motivate me to do things better and work harder. At the same time, I really admire students' energy. They are full of energy. They have full of potential. They can do whatever they want. And that's related to youth. But I think that kind of energy really gives me the inspiration. Wow, okay. Thank you so much, Professor Kwan, for this Talk Talk session.